Hello ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. My name is Mr. Do and science is my business. Well, welcome to Mr. Do Science World. And today we're going to talk about projectile motions. We're going to look at projectile motions from one dimension. So we're dealing with what? 1D. Right. Now let's look at a scenario and try to understand projectile motions. So what happens during the motion of a ball? that is thrown upwards into the air. You are a physicist and now a question is thrown to you like this. Let's try and see how we can analyze this if we throw up a ball. Right. Let's describe the motion. First thing, the object will start with a maximum velocity as it leaves the thrower's hand. The second thing that will happen is that the ball will slow down as it rises in the air. The object will reach a certain point and it will have what we call a momentary stop at the top. And that momentary stop, that is the point where the ball is now going to return back into the thrower. The object speeds up as it, what, as it descends. The final velocity of the object when it again reaches the thrower's hand is the same as when it left the thrower's hand. And the last thing we can talk about the motion is that at all times the object will accelerate downwards due to the force of gravity. Now if you remember we said that anytime you throw any object up you see the object returning back into the ground. What brings back the object into the ground is as a result of what? The force of gravity. So let's now look at the motion of a particle. If I throw an object upwards, this is what is going to happen. Once I throw this object upwards, we expect that we should have a graph that looks like this. So we'll have a trajectory, which is the path that is being traced by what? By the particle. Once we have it like this, let's look at what is happening. Let's look at what is happening. We can see that at this point, we are talking about the point where the object is fully undergoing a motion in a vertical direction. Right. At the first point here, we are saying that VI is equals to maximum value up. Why are we saying it's a maximum value up? We are trying to say that the velocity that the ball or the object or the particle leaves in the thrower's hand, at that point, that is the maximum what? Velocity. And the object begins to go up. Okay, it reaches a point where we will see that the velocity is going to be equal to what? Zero. So our initial velocity is a maximum value upwards. But when it reaches the maximum height, the velocity there is equal to what? Zero. That is the point where the object is having what? A momentary stop. And that is the reason why the velocity is what? Is zero. And then the object will begin to descend down again. As it is descending, what we see is that the velocity keeps on what? Increasing as it is descending into the ground. So, we can see, I have taken a velocity from the what beginning of the thrower's hand up the beginning, we have that what, what my initial velocity, it reaches a maximum height where we have what? The word the final velocity it stops there and now it begins a journey again back into the thrower's hand so we say that the vi where it is returning we also have what vi and that is also equals to zero and then now it begins to what goes down as it is going the velocity word increases until it reaches back into the thrower's hand and that gives us the word vf being what the maximum value word down. The time for the upward journey 
will be say t. So that means that from the thrower's hand to the maximum height, the time must be equal to the time it will take the what the ball or the particle to return from the maximum height back into the thrower's hand. And remember, we are saying that this object is returning back into the ground as a result of what gravity. So a, which is the word acceleration, and now we are dealing with acceleration in an upward direction. So that must be equal to what the acceleration due to gravity. So we say a is equals to g, and that is equals to what 9.8 meters per second squared downwards. But this is somehow taken approximately as what 10 meters per second squared. So it's either we take it as 9.8 meters per second squared, or you take it as what? 10 meters per second squared, which is the approximated value. Alright. So this is how what the path that is being traced by the word by the projectile looks like. And that is what we said is what is called a trajectory. Let's move on and see. Now we are going to now look at what acceleration itself. If I am looking at an acceleration, what can we say? At any point during the journey, the acceleration of the object is equal to the what? To the gravitational acceleration. When we speak of acceleration, we are talking about what? The horizontal motions. And once we talk about what the gravitational acceleration, we are, talking, we are talking about what a vertical motion, where the object is now what in a vertical direction. So there is what there's a force of gravity acting on the object, which we have earlier said we use the symbol A, which is also the same as what G. The G is the acceleration or the gravitational acceleration. Right, and that the value we are saying is what 9.8 meters per second squared downwards towards the what? The earth. So, G is independent of the mass. When we say G is independent of the mass, what does that mean? That simply implies that irrespective of your mass, if you are undergoing a free fall from the air, if air resistance is not considered, then the mass of the object is not important. So let's look at a scenario like this. If I take a feather from a bed and I take a stone and I move on into a certain height in space and I decide to release these two objects together, my question would be, what do you think, which of these two particles or objects do you think is going to reach the ground first? Well, I know if you are not a physicist what you are going to say is that the stone is going to reach the ground first because it has what a greater mass but that is not true from the point of a physicist that is where we are saying that what g is independent of what of the mass so the two objects will reach the ground at the same time g depends upon the distance from the center of the earth. So, G is independent of the mass, but depends on the distance from the center of what? Of the earth. Now, we are talking about the projectile motions. So, what is projectile itself? A projectile is just an object which is undergoing up and down motion under the influence of what? Gravity. That means the only force that is acting on this particular object is the what? Is the force of gravity. When we try to do calculations of an object undergoing what? What a projectile motions. Or when we're talking about what projectile motions. The rare calculations that we can do under that, and we make use of what the equations of motion in doing the calculations. So now let's look at the equations of motion. Well, there are four equations of motions, 
and that is what we're going to use in the calculation of what projectiles. So first one, we said the final velocity is equal to the initial velocity plus what the gravitational acceleration multiplied by what the time taken for the object to what to undergo the motion. The second equation, if we are dealing with a horizontal motion, then we will say change in x. If you are doing a vertical motion, we say change in y. So it depends on which one that which motion that we are considering. So now let's look at it. Change in x, which is delta x, is equals to v i t plus half g t squared. That is the second equation. And then our third equation is v f squared is equals to v i squared plus two g what two g s. I am going to use s here. I know. S is not familiar with most of you. S simply represents the word the displacement here. So you can use your S as what? Your X or your Y. Depending on which motion you are considering. Either a vertical motion or a horizontal motion. So I will simply use S to represent the word the displacement in this case. And the last equation here is changing X is equals to the final velocity plus the initial velocity divided by 2 multiplied by the time. And this is what we refer to as what the equations of motion. And this is going to help us in doing the calculation of what? Of projectile motions. Let's now try and see some graphs of motions for what? Or some graphs of motion for the projectile motion. All right. We are going to consider four different graphs here. And I am not going to deal with the analysis of the graphs for now. There will be a video that will be talking about only the, word, the analysis of graphs of motion of a projectile word motion. But for now, we just want to look at the four different types of graphs that we can have for a projectile motion. So let's begin. The first one that we'll be looking at is the what is the displacement versus time graph. Okay. If I have a displacement versus time graph, that simply implies that what? My Y component is going to be the displacement and the T component, the horizontal component is going to be what? The time. All right. So, remember we are talking about displacement versus time here. So, all that I am going to do is that the shape of the graph is just what? A parabola. A parabola which like we're going to see what? The one that is not smiling. A sad what? Parabola. A sad one. Unhappy. Alright. We can also talk about velocity versus time for a projectile motion. And how does the shape look like? It is what? A linear what? Graph. Either moving from the y axis downwards or moving from the what the whether you move downwards like where we are looking at the demand curve or going to look like what a supply curve if you are an economist. All right. So we can either have it that the gradient is what an increasing gradient or a decreasing gradient, depending on the what your direction of motion. That you are considering and we can also talk about what a situation where we will look at what the gradient of that particular graph so let's say we have the velocity versus time we can talk about the gradient of the graph and the gradient of the graph we are looking at in this situation must be equal to the word the gravitational acceleration that means that the value is going to be what 9.8 meters per second squared, which is approximately what 10 meters per second squared, and that depends. So it could be what negative, and I would call it negative in this direction because we are always saying that what the acceleration due to gravity is always acting where downwards. So I would consider that downward motion to be what a negative one. We will look at this when we start with the calculations. All right. 
They can also talk about what? Acceleration versus time. Graph. For the projectile motions. And in this situation, how does the graph going to look like? Well, the graph is just going to be parallel to the what? To the x-axis. So the graph of acceleration versus time is parallel to the what? To the x-axis. So this is how the graph will also look like. And the last one that we can talk about, and remember that also even in the acceleration versus time graph, we can still talk about the gradient. Displacement versus time, we can still talk about the gradient as well. So you should know. Once we're talking about that, since the displacement versus time is a parabola, if you want to find the gradient, we just need to draw what a tangent to the word, to the curve. And that will help us to what to determine the gradient. With the acceleration versus time, we know that is very what is parallel to the x-axis, so we can easily find what the gradient of that graph. All right. Now let's see the last graph that we can talk about. And that is the word displacement. Sorry, that is distance versus time graph. How does the distance versus time graph look like? Well, the distance versus time graph is what? It's sinusoidal. Okay? Or we say it's just like what? The, the polynomial graph. So we're going to have polynomial graph. Two parabolas combined together. That's what it's going to look like. All right. And we can as well find the gradient of that graph as well because we know we can also draw a tangent to that and find the gradient. And remember, in each of the cases, the gradient must be equal to the word, the gravitational acceleration. Which is a constant. All right, now let's look at a free fall and terminal velocity. So let's begin by looking at the definitions of the term free fall as well as terminal velocity. So when we say a free fall, what do we mean by a free fall? A free falling object is an object that is falling under the sole influence of gravity. An object that is being acted upon only by the force of gravity is said to be in a state of a free fall. So free falling objects do not encounter air resistance. Now let's look at what we mean by terminal velocity. Okay. A terminal velocity is the maximum velocity attainable by an object as it falls through a fluid. So it occurs when the sum of the drag force and the buoyancy is equal to the downward force of gravity acting on the object. Since the net force on the object is zero, the object has what? A zero acceleration. All right. Let's break this down and understand that properly. Right. Object only accelerates downwards at 9.8 meters per second squared in a vacuum near the Earth's surface. So in air, air resistance will always increases and decreases the acceleration to values less than what? 9.8 meters per second squared. So since we are saying we are talking about a free fall, we are trying to say that the only force that is acting is the force of gravity which is a constant value of 9.8 meters per second squared. The very moment we consider the air resistance, then we are saying that the air resistance will keep on increasing as the object is falling, and that will automatically decrease the, what? the, what? the gravitational force, which is a constant. Smooth objects will experience less air resistance. And in that case, our A, which is the acceleration, will be equal to the gravitational acceleration initially for all objects. So if air resistance is large and increasing, acceleration decreases to zero. 
and the object falls at a constant velocity which we call the terminal velocity. Now, let's look at this. When the parachutist jumps, his or her acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared downwards. The only force which will be acting on him or her is the force of the what? Of the earth. So in that case, we will say that what? F-R-E-S is downwards. And the free body diagram for that is just going to be like what we are seeing here. As his or her velocity increases, so does the force of the air resistance opposing the downward force of what? Of gravity. And then, in that situation, our F, R, E, S is still downward, but it is now going to be what? Smaller. So, it will look something like this. We can you see the free body diagram looking like this. Now let's move ahead and see what happens. Air resistance is due to what? Collusions. With what? With the particles of the air. The greater the velocity of the parachutes, the greater the number of collusions and the greater the air resistance. So FRES decreases until it equals to zero. And our acceleration would therefore be equals to what? Zero. So our free body diagram would then look like this. Where the upward force and the downward force are now what? Equal. So the parachutist or the parachutist now falls with what? A constant velocity. Which we will call what? A terminal velocity. At that point. Alright, let's proceed and see. Whenever that we are doing a calculation on a projectile motion, we are saying that we make use of the equations of motion. How do we determine which equation to use in solving that particular problem that you are being given? Now let's look at it. So tips to help you use the equations of motion for projectile motions. Number one, you will choose a direction as positive. The choice is yours to decide here. You can decide to choose your upward motion as positive or your downward motion as positive. You have the right to choose which direction to be positive. You will decide on the time interval that is relevant to the what? To the question. And then you will write down the unknown values, that is, your initial velocity, your final velocity, your acceleration, your change in displacement, either in the x direction or in the y direction, and then the time. If an object is released or dropped by a person, that is moving up or down at a certain velocity, the initial velocity of the object will be equal to the velocity of that person. Now let's take for example, if I have a hot air balloon and a person is in this hot air balloon and the balloon is being what? Moving upwards and it reaches a certain height. And the person releases a ball from the balloon or from the hot air balloon. The velocity of the ball is now going to be equal to the what? The velocity of the moving what? Balloon. That is what we're saying. All right. Let's try and now apply our knowledge. So apply your knowledge here and let's see. We're going to look at some calculation question, which is going to be the last thing that we're going to look at in this video. 
I am going to do another video where we'll be dealing with only calculations or problem solving on projectile motions for what 1D. So let's begin by looking at this question. A bullet is fired vertically upwards at 200 meters per second. Ignore the effect of air resistance and calculate question number one. The maximum height reached. Question number two. The time taken for the bullet to be at a height of 1,500 meters on each way down. And question number three. At what height it will be moving at 100 meters per second upwards. Now this is the problem that we need to solve. Let's look at the information that we are being given in this particular question. We know the velocity. The bullet is fired vertically upwards at a velocity of 200 meters per second. So now we are being given some certain information, which is the word, the velocity. So let's solve this problem. This is how your answer should look like. For question number one, I am taking my upward as positive. So the direction in an upward direction, upward direction is positive. The initial velocity was given, which was 2,200 meters per second. Remember, the object was released, or the object was what? Going upward. So, if it is being thrown vertically upward, the initial velocity is positive. So, I will say that VI is equals to positive 200 meters per second. And my final velocity, remember the object has reached a certain height. The first question is for us to find the maximum height. The object has reached the maximum height. And according to the analysis we did, whenever an object reaches a maximum height, there is a momentary stop. Therefore, velocity there is what? Zero. So we say V final is equals to zero meters per second. And now we know that our acceleration due to gravity or the gravitational acceleration is now being equals to what? 9.8 meters per second squared. But remember here, the G, which is the gravitational acceleration, is acting what? It's acting downwards. Therefore, the value must be what? Negative here. So, we'll say G is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, what we want to find is to find what? The change in X. That is the unknown that we need to look for here. So, which equation do we use? Well, the time is not given, therefore, the first equation would not be the appropriate one. But the appropriate equation to use is Vf squared is equals to Vi squared plus 2G changing X. So once we know this equation, the rest is for us to do the substitution. So let's substitute and solve for the value. If we substitute this, our V final is 0. So it's going to be 0 is equals to 200 squared. So we're having our 200 squared because the initial velocity is what? 200. Plus, what do we have? We have 2 multiplied by, by what? by the g which is what which is 9.8 but remember that is negative so it's going to be negative 9.8 and then we'll multiply that by what by the displacement which is what change in x and when we do that what are we going to have okay all we are going to do is that remember we are looking for a change in x so if I multiply all these together, 200 squared is going to give me what? 2,000 meters. Sorry, 200 squared is going to give us what? If you have your 200 and we square that, we're going to have our 40,000. 
and we're going to multiply 2 by 9.8 which is going to give us what 19.6 so we have 9.8 okay and we're multiplying that by 2 so we are getting what we're getting 19.6 we'll transpose the 40,000 and then we're going to divide it by this 19.1.6 so we have 40,000 and then we are dividing 40,000 by our 19.1 6 and what are we having we are going to have 2040.81 what meters upwards because it is a positive value that is why we are saying it is what upwards so you can either write it as changing s is equals to 2040.8 what 2 meters or we we'll say that change in x is equals to 2040.82 meters upwards. Let's solve question number two. Question number two, we have to consider the time period from when the bullet was fired until it is what? 500 meters above the starting position. So what do I do? I know the initial velocity which is positive 200 meters per second. Remember that I said my upward motion is positive. Then my g is now equals to what? Negative 9.8 meters squared. And what is my change in x? Change in x is given as what? 500 meters. And what I am looking for is the what? Is the time. The time is what is not known. If the time is not known, then the appropriate equation to use is change in x is equals to vit plus half gt squared. So now when we do the substitution, we're going to have a positive 500 is equals to plus 200 multiplied by t plus half multiplied by negative 9.8 multiplied by t squared and once we have this what we're going to have is that we're going to have what a quadratic equation so what we're going to have if we transform that we're going to have 4.9 t squared minus 200 t plus 500 equals to zero which is a quadratic equation and then we can use the quadratic formula to solve the problem if we solve this problem, then we're going to have our t, going to have two values for t. So it's going to be t1 to be equals to 38.14 seconds and t2 being equals to 2.68 seconds. Now, the correct answer here, we're looking for when the object is going what? Upwards or when it is above 500 meters from the starting position therefore the correct answer to that particular one is the word is the t2 which is what 2.68 seconds the 38.14 seconds is when the bullet is on the way what on the way down let's look at the question number three question number three we are to consider the time interval from when the bullet is fired until it has a velocity of 100 meters per second upwards. So, we are given the initial velocity, which is positive 200 meters per second. Final velocity now is given to us as positive 100 meters per second. And now we know our g is negative 9.8 meters per second. And what are we looking for? What we are looking for here is for us to find what? We are told that we have to consider the what? The time interval. All right, so the equation to use here is vf squared is equals to vi squared plus 2g dot x. And now let's do the substitutions from here and solve for that value. Alright, so if I square 100, 
I am going to have what? I'm going to have 10,000. And then we're going to square the 200. Okay, so we have to square 200 as well. And when we square 200, we get them 40,000. So we've gotten our 40,000. And then we will multiply the 2 by the 9.8. And that should give us negative what? 19.6. Uh, okay, S. Which X is now the what? Our displacement. And now I want to look for that displacement today. So what do I do? All I need to do is that I'm going to transpose that and I'm going to subtract what? So I'll say 40,000 minus 10,000. And that is going to give me 30,000. And I'll divide it by what? 19.6. And once I do that, I'm expected to have what? I'm expected to have 1,530.61. Meters. If we decide to consider significant figures, then we're going to have what? 1,500 what? Meters. So whichever way, you know, you're going to use the significant figures or you're going to use the decimal places, we're going to have that particular one. For decimal places, two decimal places, we're going to have 1530.61 okay, meters. And if you use the significant figures, or if you consider the sick fake, then we're going to have what? 1,500 meters. Because it is what? Two significant figures. All right. Thank you very much for watching this video. And please, uh, if you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And as you subscribe, please like our videos, share the videos, and give your comment for your comment is very important we love you keep learning for learning is life and life is learning see you next time in our next video where we'll be dealing with what problem solving in projectile motions for what one dimension thank you and see you next time bye bye